Thank you. Wes, please. Yes, yeah, so, so gladly. So what Microsoft has uh, to contribute is something different than what you've heard here today, but still really important. One of the things that we saw very early on is the Ukrainian networks and compute infrastructure was being targeted. It would disrupt their ability to communicate, collaborate, uh, and coordinate and support their mission. We moved the Ukrainians to our cloud, and as a result, it provided survivability to the constant attacks that they're under on the cyber side. We even listed all of our different cyber defense resources to support them, have an open, secure line of providing that support daily uh, throughout the process. And then in addition to that, there are some other areas that we're supporting the International Criminal Court to deliver justice for war crimes in Ukraine. We do that through using cognitive services to collect digital evidence to support that. And then a, a simple way that's very important for your everyday citizen in the Ukraine is providing free calling minutes through Skype. 43 million minutes that we've provided so far to keep families connected and be able to let everyone know that they're safe and uh, keep those lines of communication open. Great, thank you all. Um, obviously a very relevant and important topic. So I'm just uh, going to ask the team, how are we doing on uh, other questions? And uh, while we have that, um, today at lunch, the chief mentioned acquisition at the speed of relevance, I believe were his words. Um, and, and several of you have addressed this, the speed, pace, in acquisition. Um, so, so the question kind of is a, is a two-part question. Do we have the, do we have the right culture um, inside the government to be able to do that? These are, these are big systems, high dollar value systems. Um, you want to get the acquisition right. So it can be a little bit of a risk averse culture. Uh, and then do we have the authorities in place? And you know, Wes mentioned OTAs, other transaction authorities. There's mid-tier acquisition. There's, uh, I believe, some relatively new software acquisition authorities that should help to increase the pace. Um, so again, that, that's the question. One is kind of a culture question inside the Army, and then you know, do we have the right tools in place? And, and maybe, Mr. Bush, if you could lead off, please. Uh, sure. So first of all, we've got the people. We've got the professionals. They can do things very quickly, and I've seen it. I see it every day. Um, do we have the authorities? Yes, broadly speaking, I think we do. We just have to use them aggressively, and that's where leadership comes in. Um, uh, all the way down the chain. And I uh, mentioned like the COVID response, for example, and Ukraine response. I mean, when we can, when we gotta go fast, we can go fast. So uh, speed is not the only factor that of course we have to worry about in acquisition. Uh, it's the classic, you know, you want it fast, you want it good. I mean, you, you get to pick. Um, but we, um, I think it's all about balance. So uh, right now, schedule is the priority and speed is what the leaders want. That's what uh, the message from Congress is. So we are absolutely focused on that. It's my number one priority. But we can't lose sight of maintaining, of course, cost. Got to make sure that costs stay in bounds. And finally, and really most critically, at the end of the day, performance. So performance is what can be a life and death difference for a piece of equipment for a soldier in actual combat. So getting things fast, I'm all for it. Believe me, I work this every day. But we can have, we can't, there's no negotiation on performance. Things have to be effective in combat under the most difficult conditions, as the uh, generals were talking about, because that's where the lives are on the line. So that means, well, how do we do that? Uh, testing, for starters, realistic and thorough testing of our systems, including cyber testing, uh, is another major push. So I believe we can do all of that more quickly. I think we are right now. I think the Army's showing that. But, um, while we're doing that, you can't lose sight of the other two. Congress still cares about costs. The American people should, stare, should absolutely care about costs. It's their money. And then performance, like I said, um, we have to test our systems to make sure um, when it really matters and America's sons and daughters are out there in combat that the equipment's going to work. One thing Ukraine has shown, our equipment works in combat where it matters. The Russian stuff doesn't in a lot of cases. So I'm, that didn't just happen. That's the work of thousands of people that work for our organizations every day, ensure that American equipment uh, that we provide to our allies around the world and to the Army um, really works when it matters. And there's a tremendous effort that goes into that, but that's kind of how I'd approach the question. 
Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'd be interested if either of our industry partners had a, had a comment on this question. One of the things that I would share, I don't think America has an innovation problem. We have a great amount of innovation that's out there. We have an adoption problem. And how do we drive more adoption? And what we see is a pace of adoption in commercial industry that doesn't match up to what we see in government in defense. So how do we enable that? Because I will tell you, there's a lot of companies crossing the valley of the death right now, and there's death all around us. It is a hard journey, especially for smaller companies. They can bring some of the latest innovation. And so I would say being able to use more constructs like the OTAs, where you can demonstrate what's possible. It doesn't matter what you say is possible. It matters what you show is possible. And as you show it, then expand it and build on it and build on it and go from there. But creating that environment to drive more adoption, improve out some of this capability so that we can go faster and get innovation into the mission, I think that's what's needed. So um, I, I have a slightly maybe different perspective on this. I grew up in the commercial world. I don't come from the military background myself. The Air Environment is the first company in the last 12 years that I've worked in. Uh, but over the years, I've, I've really developed a very, very strong, uh, don't want to call it sympathy, but understanding maybe of the challenges that our military is faced with. Um, the US military is the only organization that I know in the world that if there is a competition for a capability and there was a program or record or some competition, and if a vendor doesn't like it, they can protest it. <laughs> no other industry in my life I've ever seen that, uh, that you can do that, all right? So, but that's because of the, what Mr. Bush said. It's about uh, the taxpayer dollars. And we have a checks and balance system that allow, makes sure that, you know, that this is done fairly. Um, it's a very large organization. As uh, Mr. Bush said, they're tackling the biggest problems that we have as a country <laughs> or as a society. So. I think as an industry, we need to be more understanding of speed and uh, agility in that context. And also, the last point he made, I could not agree more with it. The performance of our systems is by far what differentiates us and gives our military the advantage and the um, superiority. And we are known for that. Can it be faster? Absolutely. There is no one that I've ever met that doesn't want it to be faster. And if I do meet that person, please let me know, because I haven't run across one in 12 years. And we shouldn't. None of us should be satisfied with that. And that should be always part of our effort, that we can do things faster, better, cheaper. But overall, I mean, moving these mountains is not an easy task. And I think we got to be careful of that, number one. And number two, um, I tell my, this to my team a lot. Uh, we shouldn't be complaining about the requirements and the process and all that. Uh, to Mr. Bush's point, let's understand why they're there. There are very strong rationales behind every single one of those that I've looked at for our capabilities and things that we go after. And the more we understand that and then engage in a dialogue, the better. But I, 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 again, I want to just emphasize the point that I feel sort of bad, bad about the challenge that our military leaders have. We have a Congress that you know, that really decides a lot on the budgets. The process takes a long time. It's not to my, in my life, my career in this industry has a bit on time. Uh, we've been living through CRs for how many years now? Um, last fiscal year's budget was approved when? This year's budget is where? What month are we in now? You got to put all this in perspective and then talk about speed as much as we want. <laughs> um, just, just my perspective on this. In but, but what I really like is the uh, amount of initiatives that are going on within the U.S. Army for modernization and innovation. Um, impressive, for me at least, for AV, quite impressive from my perspective. And I can't wait to see all those become uh, capabilities for military soldiers. Yeah, I, I would give... Um, uh, in, in order to avoid fixating on materiel, um, I think we have to open the aperture. And, you know, Jim talked a little bit about it in terms of Dotlam PFP. Um, I think there are three areas where are enabling to what we're doing in the acquisition process, but where we're still uh, kind of haven't, you know, shifted the culture uh, and really uh, uh, been innovative in our approaches. So one is how we do foreign military sales. Uh, our process, our processes are 20th century. Um, they're too lockstep, too rigid. In many cases, they're late to need. 
and in my mind, um, cause us to lose the edge in campaigning, which will affect crisis and conflict. So that's one. The second piece is in terms of how we do MILCON. You know, we talked about material. Material has to go in units. We build our struck units, um, place them in uh, throughout the world. But but if we don't have the facilities uh, to to place these material solutions and obviously the formations that we build uh, will be late to need. So the MILCON process, I think, has to be streamlined, way too bureaucratic. And then the last piece, uh, and is uh, demonstrated by what we've just done with 18th Airborne Corps, AMC, is in order to see near real time data analytics and consumption rates and on-hand quantities and FMC rates, for class seven, class five, et cetera, it took almost four months to get uh, ATOs uh, so that we could see that, so we could preemptively make decisions and execute tasks from the continent of the United States that would allow us to be anticipatory uh, in our actions at the tactical level in Europe. Uh, and so those are three areas where, you know, I think we're making great progress, but, but three areas where I think we really need to focus our efforts outside the acquisition process and focus in other areas that enable that. Great, thank you all very much. Uh, so the, the next question is is primarily um, focused on uh, um, on our Army uh, panel members here and ASALT, AMC, and AFC, and it gets to what General Daly was just saying, Ad, is um, obviously we're fielding all this new um, technology, all these new weapon systems and capabilities. Um, soldiers have to learn how to use it, they have to be trained on it, um, there has to be doctrine that go, that's associated with it. Um, new organization designs may be part of it coming out of the Army's total analysis process and other processes and that come out of combat developments. And so the question is, um, how, how are these being coordinated across AMC, ASALT, Army Futures Command um, as we move the Army to, to 2020? So it's not obviously just moving to a new set of equipment. We're moving kind of toward a new army of, of 2030, and how do we synchronize and coordinate all that? Well, the, uh, I think we've been clear that it it's, takes a whole bunch of folks do, you know, playing their position to, to be a great team, right? So it starts with our secretary, uh, who's in charge and has kind of charted the course, and our chief, who's responsible for our soldiers and formations also, and has issued real clear guidance about prioritization. Um, we have uh, secretariat roles and responsibilities, the Honorable Bush, but also our MNRA's got a big piece of that. IE&E, they play a role. Um, we have congressional oversight that, uh, you know, that I've been around, I've been in countries that it doesn't have that, and there's downsides to that also. So I'm, I'm, I don't mind that. I think it makes us better. Uh, so we got all the players. Then you got the Army staff. General Matlock, I think, was here, the G357 of the Army. Uh, that job exists to integrate and synchronize the Army campaign plan, which our Secretary in Chief just approved recently that's that's all about uh integration and synchronization and you got four acoms right so you know without giving you the how the army runs class uh, you know the end of the day here but our great teammates and trade ops are responsible for people and uh not to speak for them in general brito but that that's that's our superpower that's the most lethal weapon system we'll ever put on the battlefield is a, is a well-trained well-led uh, U.S. Army soldier, leader development, building the NCO Corps. <clears throat> they also got a lot of force mod proponency and integration adoptable PFP of parts of the Army of 2030. General Daly gets, you know, MRE and the further furthest forward rifle squad all the way back to the defense industrial base and sustaining everything in between that, working with a bunch of people. Force Com owns, owns current readiness, my, my teammate General Pappas, and AFC's in the future readiness business, right? We deliver 2030, design 2040. Again, not by ourselves, not in a territorial possessive way, as part of a team of teams. So uh, it's a lot of work, and I don't want to make it sound like it's it, there's not friction, but any, anything worth doing, 
is, is got some hard times and some good times, but we got the right teams. I, uh, General Daly and I have fought together and served together our whole time, so I'll use us as an example. Um, uh, if you've been in combat and you've done some of the hard things we've had to do, the commanders that, that come out of that crucible are the ones that figure out that relationships between commanders are way more important than command relationships. And uh, I feel very confident that me and my teammates uh, in uniform and our great civilians uh, all share the desire to, to be successful. So that's, that's a way better answer than I was going to give, which was going to be terabytes of PowerPoint <laughs> and a whole bunch of team, Microsoft Teams meetings. Um, thank you. Um, so for our industry partners, um, you know, you have the, the friction or the, the trade-off challenge of having to, uh, um, to operate and fund what you've currently got and sustain what you've currently got deployed. Um, and Mr. Nawabi, you mentioned this a little bit. And then tr also trying to determine how, to, how you invest in the future for, you know, um, additional capabilities, more research and development. Um, can can maybe the two of you talk to about how you and your companies make those uh, those decisions and how you see that? Sure. So I mean, our process is no different than any other organization, uh, whether it's government or non-government or uh, private companies uh, or public companies. We have a short-term, mid-term, and long-term planning process uh, that we go through every year. Every year, all three of them are revisited, and we look at those. Uh, it all starts with the external forces, though. The first thing we do is assess the um, re requirements, the capability gaps, and the needs of our customers and the, and the environments they serve. That, by far, is the most important piece for us in, um, in sort of making the determination as to where should we place our bets and what, why should we place those bets where we place them. Um, as a company, we're not afraid at all, and we're proud of the fact that we invest a lot on IRAD. Um, we've done it for the last, as I said, almost a decade that I know of, that I've been in this role, this company. Um, and you know, we've gone as high as like 18% of revenue several years ago, uh, and that is unheard of in a public company, uh, especially in aerospace and defense industry is non-existent to my knowledge, actually, except us. Um, and so the reason why we do it is because we believe in the capability that it will deliver. A uh, great example is something like Switchblade. We invested in Switchblade a decade plus ago. A uh, vast majority of that was internally funded R&D. Um, and we do always have a partnership with our customer, Army or others, um, to co-invest with us, but we don't expect them to fit, uh, foot all the bill. Uh, and that's fundamental as part of our strategy. So based on those requirements and external factors as to what's happening in the world and what should we do, we decide on a strategy to focus on prioritized areas of gap and capability, and then we start investing in those things for short-term, mid-term, and long-term. And that's how we do that. And then we look at a portfolio in terms of a balance between short, medium, and long-term, and that's a very rigorous process that we do, and then we go communicate that and pass that by to our customers. Ask the first ent entities, our customers, um, we talk to them about it. You know, they only can give us limited amount of feedback because of the position they're in, which is totally understandable, uh, and the rules around that, that governs it. And then we also communicate that to our employees and to our shareholders, our, our owners. Uh, that's the basic of the process that we follow. Uh, what I can tell you is that the area that we're focused on, we're very, very fortunate, is one of the most important areas in the aerospace and the FIST today. All, it's all about unmanned systems. It's all about interoperability. It's all about mo uh, modular open systems architecture and systems that General uh, Daly was talking about and Mr. Bush. Uh, and then it's all about AI and autonomy, but always the operator, the soldier, the warfighter, and the loop to make sure that they make the right determination. And fundamentally, that's where we invest, and it's about a third of our workforce in terms of our workforce, the entire workforce, being a manufacturing company, we do that. Um, and that's kind of the process that we follow uh, on a regular basis. The pipeline looks very robust. That's all I can tell you, that we're very, very uh, delighted. We're looking forward to a lot of the activities. I think that a lot of things are lining up. Uh, it's rare that both houses of the Congress, both parties, uh, the White House, 
the public in general, our allies, they all support investing in the future of our military. And I hope that that continues for the next several years. And uh, as Mr. Bush mentioned, you know, that's, that's what they were focused on. They're focused on delivering those capabilities um, to the warfighter, uh, not just one tomorrow, but the next several, several years and decades to come. Great, thank you. Wes, any comments from a Microsoft perspective? Yeah, I'd say for us, it's also looking at the three horizons. Looking at today, looking near term, looking at long term. If you look at today, for example, one of the things we hear from many customers, you'd love to move to the cloud, but you have a significant investment on-prem, and we gotta continue to support that while you bridge over to cloud. We also know some things take time. I mentioned I was here 25 years at Microsoft. We didn't always have the best reputation when it came to security. I remember uh, working back in when Bill Gates was here 20 years ago, we had some really tough days back then. And he said, this is our Achilles heel. And he put his foot down and said, no more. And that was the first billion dollar investment that we made in trustworthy computing. Look back or, or go, go forward now 20 years, we've invested $20 billion. And it's given us an, a capability from a cyber perspective that's unmatched. But you don't get there in a year, you don't get there in two years, five years, you gotta have persistence. It tests your will. We look at uh, quantum as another area. We've been working on it for 20 years. Is it gonna take five more years, 10 more years? We don't know, but what we do know, you don't wanna be late to that delivery. The one that comes in second or third, there's gonna be great consequences. You have to be putting the investment in every day to get there first. And so for us, we are looking long-term, short-term, mid-term. We're taking customer feedback. We're looking at where the market is going and then combining all that to look at where we make our investments. Great, thank you very much. Um, so the next question I think is uh, AMC and AFC centric. Um, so we talked about um, the challenging of delivering Army 2030 and redesigning the Army for 2040. Um, and in that context, the SEC Army has also laid out a new climate strategy which places new and challenging performance requirements on combat and combat support vehicles. Um, how will you manage that given that at least on the 2030 timeline, um, you know, we're, we're a little bit, uh, at least according to the author here, we may be a little bit late in the timeline to meet those requirements. Yeah, hey, Doug, you want to go first and then I'll jump in? Oh, you want me to go first? Okay. <laughs> you see what I'm trying to do here. Um, no, hey, um, so one, uh, if you listen to the secretary yesterday, yesterday? Yesterday. Um, she was very, very clear in terms of tasking Army Material Command uh, within the context of Indo-Pacific um, to look at how we are going to operate in a contested environment sustain and maintain combat power to tactical edge um, and do it in concert with industry. Uh, and, and I would add one piece that says that this again is gonna be a team effort. Uh, and so I will tell you there's no daylight between Jim Rainey and I uh, from a standpoint of looking at 2040 capabilities. Um, we already know some of the technological advances we're going after in terms of 21st century watercraft in terms of uh, autonomous air and ground systems, uh, in terms of platform demand reduction for fuel uh, to electric and hybrid, and I know Honorable Bush will talk more about that, et cetera. Um, but also uh, atmospheric water generation, um, and, and the list goes on. And as we focus on the Indo-Pacific, you know, there's other pieces. Uh, how do we apply Army pre-positioned stock? Uh, how do we look at Army pre-positioned stock afloat and capitalize on uh, windows of, of access, what we have with countries, uh, to then um, demonstrate presence to gain long-term influence, et cetera. So there's a myriad of things we'll look at in concert with Jim on the Army Futures Command side, and then simultaneously with Doug Bush uh, from a a standpoint of materiel, uh, and then how we look at it from a, a strategic side in the organic industrial base, because as we talked about, if you're gonna look at, you know, contested logistics, you really have to look at 
tactical edge all the way to the continental United States, to your power projection platforms, and to your organic industrial base, and more broadly to the defense industrial base. So this is a huge effort focused on 2030 and 2040, uh, but I think with these two great partners here, uh, and TRADOC, uh, specifically CASCOM and the Army G4, I think uh, we're going to head in the right direction on this. So, Doug, I'm sorry if I... A couple uh, specific things to mention. So, I think if uh, the good news is we are able to, for energy demand reduction, uh, we are able to draft on a ton of private sector investment in this area. So, commercial industry is uh, leading on this, and we are uh, going to benefit from their investments. In particular, uh, I think where we'll make the most progress by 2030 is really on the wheeled vehicle side. So there, uh, there's a lot of industry investments that we can fall right in on and use. We're starting with anti-idle technology. We're going to move towards uh, hybrid electric vehicles. And then, uh, f so that right there will uh, get to a lot of the uh, Secretary's goals. We also have to do the R&D, though, to eventually get, if it makes sense, and when the heavier vehicles. There's a lot of great R&D work out there already being done. So I think that's going to nest in uh, nicely. Uh, also, uh, just buying more modern equipment actually can make a difference. Newer transmissions by themselves can save a lot of fuel. Uh, more fuel-efficient engines, like the ITEF engine we're working on for future rotorcraft, save a lot of fuel. So there's a lot of different doors we can push on, and I think right now um, there's a lot of great efforts underway that I think we just uh, would need to follow through, stay close to industry and how they're approaching it. And I think there's a lot we can do, actually, by 2030 while we uh, look to the far future. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jerry, if I could just jump in. One of the things we hadn't talked about related to this is, you know, because when you look at the Army Climate Strategy Implementation Plan, is you know, many tasks that go beyond just tactical systems and really look at installations. And so we're really looking at that closely with the Assistant Secretary of the Army, IE&E. Um, in terms of just microgrids as an example, 21 microgrids out there in installations, another 105 that are in the works. Uh, and 50% of our organic industrial-based depot arsenals and ammunition pl uh, plants are already renewable energy. So it's getting at this resilience piece uh, and protection piece so that um, it really supports the Army uh, climate strategy, but more important, it, it, it operates very, very effectively within a, cont a contested environment. So the, the next question is a question about the network. So acknowledging the threats that exist in, in the multi-domain operating environment and our efforts to modernize and improve our current capabilities, how does the Army and industry partners intend to protect future battle networks in a non-contiguous and contested environment? Um, so I don't know if we have a volunteer to, to go first. Um, Wes, do you want to give, yes, a, give so a shot maybe, at that? Maybe I'll, I'll get us started. So Microsoft's made a significant investment in our cloud network around the world. And one of the things that we recognize is we got to have multiple paths in case there's an interruption. Obviously, that includes fiber, 5G, the satellite, so LEO, NEO, GEO. We think a lot of that can be leveraged to help support the mission. So that's certainly a great asset. And for us, it all feeds into our overall cyber defense center. So if you look at that, right now we're pulling 8 trillion signals a day. The thing about attackers, they have to do something out of the norm as part of their attack. That's an anomaly. And for us, cloud enables a better identification of those anomalies based on the telemetry, based on the amount of signals that we have, and based on our ability to use AI to take our people and apply them to the harder problems versus trying to find the needle in the haystack. I think that's a benefit that the Army can leverage. May I? So, uh from my, our perspective, and I just only can share the perspective of the areas that we're focused on and involved in um, on this topic, though relevantly speaking, uh, the first thing is to me that, that stands out is that the network has to be such that it's not a network. It's a very ubiquitous, <coughs> call it a mesh distributed network. So any failure point in the network does not cause that network to be non-resilient. So the resiliency to me is the most important thing. Um, it's sort of like the World Wide Web. Is, it, is there a switch or a router in the world that's going to go down? Yeah, it goes down every second, if not every millisecond. 
but the internet's still alive. So, maybe, so similar concept, I think, has to be thought about, and I think military is already thinking about that and doing that, going that route. Um, the, the second thing is, uh, this is actually credit to the Win Microsoft. I call this from my personal experience in the world, the old days, um, the mainframe versus the distributed architecture of Wintel. I've said this many times before, Windows and Intel. You know, computing started with mainframes. The first organizations that could afford that were banks, government, telecom, insurance, and that's pretty much it. Uh, most other industries and companies and con consumers couldn't afford them. And then I remember 1995 when Windows 95 was uh, launched and this company called Intel and Windows came up and they came up with this distributed architecture of computing. And I call that distributed versus mainframe. And guess what's happened in the last 30, 40 years? We all know. The proliferation of computing on our wrists to our, you name it, cars, devices, bicycles even, everywhere. And that's because of the fact that we took computing to a different level. Um, did we, do, you know, made, made mainframes irrelevant? No, actually, mainframes is a healthy business today. It's just that the Windows, Intel, slash distributed architecture of computing has grown dramatically. I think a similar construct, this is just my personal view, is very applicable to d defense, military. Uh, big aircrafts, big carriers, F-35s are never going to go, you know, out of demand. But the future is all about a distributed architecture of warfare and distributed architecture of defense so you're not vulnerable. You know, it's very risky when you lose a multi-billion dollar submarine. You lose a lot of capability. You could lose a thousand of our drones and still be very, very capable. <laughs> and so this concept of attributable, concept of distributed, concept of resilient capability, we see it in Ukraine. Right? It's a great example of how you can defeat a very powerful you know, enemy with a distributed architecture of defense or military capability. So those are the two areas. And the last one I would say is AI and autonomy is going to play a much bigger role. And if you're not investing in it as a company, as an industry, then uh, you're going to be disappointed in the future, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I uh, understand it. I'm in the presence of some very smart uh, people. I don't disagree with anything either of you said. Uh, interesting, if you put a piece of network technology into a unit, it has to reduce complexity fog friction, not increase it. So that, that, that's something that I think we should all be thinking about. And so think about some of the stuff we've put into command posts and did it did it make it easier to fight or harder? Um, so that's something. Um, I think we got to start talking, and, and General Daly and I are arguing over which one of us started saying this first, but arrived at the same conclusion that we need to talk sensor to shooters to sustainers, right? Sensor to shooters to sustainer, offensive and defensive shooters, and we need to connect that right and not to win that way but that creates the conditions that let us do what we do which is dominate the land domain with lethal credible maneuver forces right but to create the conditions for that success it's a sensor to shooter to sustainer linkage and uh, you know we we in the army don't don't fight technology we don't fight things we fight formations so I think for our uniform commanders out there that are thinking about a network, uh, we have to be able to maneuver it. We need to think about fighting the network, right? All the components and there's technology and everything else. There's humans, but the way that we would think about some combinations of tanks, Bradleys, mortars, artillery pieces, and, and then again, the most decisive rifle squad, uh, we need to train commanders that think that same or the way we fight our sustainment enterprise. We need to start thinking about fighting a network that way because you're, you're, no commander is going to get to the place where it's going to be there all the time. So how do I create the conditions that it's there at the decisive point when I can take it away from my enemy, create the conditions, and then be, be it's a relative advantage temporal relative advantage that we're talking about in the new 3.0, which I'm sure you all read last night instead of going out after the conference. 
Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, I think, uh, probably start with Mr. Bush, and, and, I, and I think we've covered some of this, uh, but maybe not all. And the question is, how are we adjusting the acquisition paradigm to account for the rapidly changing tech, technology advantages by our adversaries? By the time we are able to bring a program of record to delivery, the adversary has is developing counter capabilities. And I'd, I'd probably take the question one step further, I and mean, we're not only acquiring things, you know, at the speed of relevance, uh, but we've got to acquire them at, at the Army scale, right? This is a huge, huge United States Army Active Guard and Reserve, and it often takes many years to fully field a system across the whole force. So from those two perspectives, um, can you talk about how we're doing acquisition? Sure. So the first one is um, one thing to keep in mind. Uh, you know, we read a lot about how our enemies are out, supposedly outpacing us. Um, and I read a lot of that about a lot of Russian equipment. Well, we're seeing what's real now. So one thing to keep in mind is that foundationally, my working assumption is that the American way of life, freedom, markets, free people, entrepreneurs, and innovation will outperform anyone in the world. So that's my foundational assumption. I'm biased, our system's better. And our system, as long as we fund it well, we have all the talent in this country we need to accomplish that. So I don't worry about that per se. What I do have concerns about is making sure that we are keeping up with uh, all the help from the military, informing uh, the requirements and threat-informed requirements with a product of good intelligence feeding into acquisition systems. So one way to get at the issue, though, and it is a fair question, is those new authorities I mentioned. Give us flexibilities we haven't had before to adjust course when we need to. Um, one imperative is just as an organization, we, the whole army, need to be able to, when we need to, uh, realize we're headed in a direction that's not sound anymore and move in a new one. But do that uh, you know, within all the constraints we have from uh, Congress and following the law, which we absolutely will do. But I think the system, um, I think we're getting, as we do those one at a time, I think we're getting confidence in that building with uh, Congress. If we show we can do it successfully and responsibly, um, then I think we'll get that kind of leeway in the future. Um, so I'm, I think we have the authorities we need to do it. We just have to kind of work together and make sure we've got a good plan when we need to change direction. But broadly speaking, I'll put our system of government and, and market up against everybody in the world, and I think ours is better. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Uh, not, not on the acquisition. I agree with the, uh, Mr. Bush, but from the requirements, you know, uh, we got to be fast. We got to be smart. We got to be great learners, um, and, and we need to stay uh, iterative and flat, and collaborative. Uh, so, project convergence is is ongoing right now. It's a army-led but joint and move into coalition approach to experimentation, so concepts and experimentation. And that has to do a lot of things for us. Uh, it's not just about the deep future. It's not about 2030. We, we will see things in there in that experimentation. Uh, we'll see things as General Flynn and his team out in Indo-PACOM campaign aggressively daily. Uh, we'll see things that uh, General Williams and, and his team are, are observing uh, w with a front row seat in, in Ukraine. And those, it's, those observations, lessons learned, need to feed into our requirements process for the possibility that we might have to fight somebody tonight. They need to inform as we make adjustments, we have a pretty good idea where we're going in 2030, but it's a 70, 80 percent. So we're going to make adjustments year over year, cycle over cycle. And what we're learning needs to also help us understand what, what we're going to design an army to do out in the 2030 to 2040 space. But the key to that is is translating that into requirements and, and staying flat and collaborative with the great teammates who go out and acquire that stuff. Yeah, hey, just to kind of link what Jim was mentioning and what you were mentioning, Honorable Bush, in terms of OTAs and then abbreviated capabilities, development documents, I, I think that's critical 
Because that's where you broadly define desired characteristics and not lock yourself into uh, specific requirements that then constrain industry to your earlier point and it lets industry go be very innovative uh, to bring in uh, industry best practices and concepts and technological advantages and as we move forward you know in the prototyping process and buy try decide I think this is huge with these soldier touch points and obviously with project convergence but I think we're on to something here that you know, is, is quite frankly demonstrating that we're delivering effects. Um, and, uh, and this is something I think we got to continue to expand on. Uh, but, but it's these authorities that we just talked about that has given us more flexibility. Great. Any other comments? Uh, I could just share an example that we're well involved with the U.S. Army. That's probably a good example of this specific one. Uh, the Army's Future Tactical UAS. It's a program that is has a series of increments, increment zero, one, two, and then final selection. Um, uh, just, you know, we've been selected, we've been awarded increment zero and one. Uh, the ultimate requirements for the U.S. Army for that is actually something that nobody can meet today. And I actually think that's a good thing. That's a good thing because, as Mr. Bush said, it's pushing us to deliver the capability that the Army needs for the next 10 plus years, right? Uh, what we've committed to, though, so far, is that we're going to c continue to deliver the increments of capability that they are requiring on a timetable that they've asked, they requested it ahead of schedule. And that's, I think, the reason why we were selected and awarded the increment zero and one. Uh, I think that's a really good example of how the U.S. Army is taking a future capability requirement for the uh, you know, combat brigades. Uh, and then writing requirements that it's going to be delivered in increments until a selection is finalized and then deployed to the rest of the Army. There are some requirements in there, like I said, that nobody can meet today on the face of this planet. And I think that's not a bad thing. I think it's good because it pushes us as an industry player to keep achieving the higher performance. Um, it has got to be realistic. So far we've been working. And our commitment to the Army is that we're going to do that ahead of your planned schedule. And so far, we've done that. And uh, I think that model is a very, very good model of trying to help get things moving and getting it deployed for the next, uh, the future of the Army. We have a, a scenario, a contract that was awarded. And instead of a traditional award where it went to only one technology company, it actually went to several. And then in every sprint, every company is competing against one another, and the top performer in, in, in that deliverable then is what's used. And then you go, and then everything is shared between the companies around how you got that outcome. And then you compete for the next sprint and on and on and on. And it is driving a pace of innovation that I've seen that's unmatched. So that would be part of my encouragement. Instead of a single award or a single cloud, that multi-award mentality and use competition to push the pace of innovation. So one brief alibi, if I could. So in my opening, I talked about factors that are contributing to success. I left off an important one, and that's delegation of authority from the uh, OSD level, Office of Secretary of Defense level, to the Army to run acquisition programs. That was a major initiative of the previous administration, uh, Secretary Lord. That's been continued with the Secretary, uh, Under Secretary LaPlante, and that makes a huge difference in the Army being able to be nimble, change direction when we need to, and just be more efficient. Now, we have to earn that delegation every day with uh, our OSD, but I think that's an overlooked factor. There was a huge grant of trust on their part. It's on us to show that we deserve it, but I didn't uh, want to, I, I was remiss in not mentioning that because without that flexibility, a lot of what we're talking about uh, in terms of being able to maintain pace and speed wouldn't be happening. Great, that was a fantastic discussion. So great question and uh, Great discussion. So we have about 10 minutes or so left, so probably time for one or two more questions, and I want to give Mr. Bush the opportunity to make any closing comments he would like, and no one has come to a microphone yet, so are there any questions, live questions from the audience, from anyone? Okay, every, everyone's shy. <laughs> or submitted them uh, on, on paper. Oh, we did, yes sir. Can you go to, a, to one of the microphones, please? On, on either side, and uh, just introduce yourself briefly. Thank you, uh, John Harbor with Defense Scoop. Uh, 
There was discussion uh, briefly of loitering munitions earlier, and I was just wondering how much of a priority is that for the Army acquisition community and you know the folks at Futures Command uh, and ASALT? And also from a defensive perspective, you know, what are your thoughts about pursuing capabilities to counter adversaries loitering munitions? It's a, ab absolutely an extremely high priority. Um, the ability to defeat counter UAS, uh, really air and missile defense from all directions at all scale. Um, it's a continuously growing threat. It's something our chief talks about continuously. Uh, it's kind of analogous to the, the counter IED fight that, w that we experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan where it's a enemy presents something, we counter, they present, you know, so it's it's not only is it a current problem, but, but we believe that as we start developing better capabilities, we're going to have to be in a continuous uh, improvement process as opposed to something you can develop a defeat mechanism to. Um, but it's, it's hugely critical. And it's also, um, <clears throat> as you talk about Army 2030, some of the decisions we made, and we talked about it in the panel the other day, for a lot of good reasons, uh, we accepted risk in our air and missile defenses as we were fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we are now at, at pursuing uh, the growth of that at the max possible uh, speed. And, and r really, the LIMFAC is more about generating the non-commissioned officers, officers, and soldiers but as fast as we can do that, there's going to be a need to uh, continue to provide them with new and better kit. But it's also, you know, you always lose, you know, if you just play defense, you lose slower. You know, all that, you know, the better your defense, and it just determines how slow you lose, right? You got you to gotta win. So one of the things, back to the observations, what you're not seeing a lot about that the United States Joint Force has a lot of capability is to go on the offense against the enemy's ability to do that. So uh, again, it is a problem, but, but the Joint Force U.S. Army has a lot of capability also. So uh, it's a great question, and I can give you the good and the bad, uh, which I know that uh, the generals uh, would like to hear all of it. Um, first of all, uh, loitering munition was born and has been incubated within the U.S. Army for a decade. <laughs> uh, they are the entity within U.S. military that buys switchblade for all of U.S. DOD, uh, and they have done that for five years. That's the good news. Um, and they've done it successfully with thousands of units that we've been delivering. AR Environment has been the primary you know, provider of that so far. Uh, the not so good news is that other services within the U.S. DOD is actually slightly ahead of the U.S. Army. Sorry to say that. I apologize. Um, uh, on actually creating a program for deployment of that. Uh, that's so somewhat of a not good news. Uh, U.S. Marine Corps has several programs called uh, Organic Precision Fire a Light or is it Organic Precision Fire munition, uh, uh, Mounted and a few others. Um, so they are moving at a faster pace, although Historically speaking, and, and so far, the track record of the Army, Army is unmatched in this area, in my personal assessment. Uh, the third point I want to make is that if you actually walk on the trade show floor, the conference today, and I did that today for about 20 minutes or so, there are in a number of examples, very, very good examples of loitering munitions for the U.S. Army and programs and priorities that the Army has for the future. So, for example, uh, not only just in our booth, but in many of our other partners and allies and other players' booths, you'll see ground vehicles with, uh, you know, loitering munitions that are already embedded or integrated with them. You'll see air vehicles, UAVs that have that capability. You'll see helicopters that have that capability as, as demonstrators. And there are several priorities within the U.S. Army that I know of, uh, future vertical lift, um, air launch effects, uh, FTUAS, at least those three that I know of, that all, and most to some extent actually relates to this too, because you want to be able to change and swap in modules or different vendors if you like. Uh, so those are all requirements and priorities within the U.S. Army that I'm aware of that I believe is demonstrated today on the floor of this event. 
Um, so that's another good news. So if when the army and the army has some programs, don't let's let's not confuse that. There's a program called LRPM that I know of, long range precision munition. It is related to a, a loitering munition that is going to be able to deliver. It's called a sprint loiter munition, and there's an example of that at the uh, at Northrop Grumman's booth, actually not our booth, Northrop Grumman's booth called the Jackal. Uh, have you seen? So, you know, that's what I can tell you. Uh, and by the way. He's, I don't think he's an Aravon employee, so it was not a planted question. <laughs> but I'm glad you asked the question because I do believe this is going to be a big deal. And there's several activities within the U.S. Army that I'm really confident about that it's going to move the ball faster in the next two to three years. And Mr. Bridget, as head of ASOL, can you talk about where your mission is a priority for you? Well, my priorities come from the Army. I don't, have, I don't really have my own. So what I'd be concerned about and most hopeful to do is to just take advantage from an acquisition standpoint of the, the innovation in the private sector on this. So there's, a, as a, a pointed out, if you just walk the floor, and I saw this at Euro Satori as well, yeah. there's lots of companies innovating here, which is great. We've got, we're not dependent on one company for this. We've got tremendous innovation happening in this space. So it just gives us lots of opportunities for when, if, you know, when the Army um, decides to prioritize this, I think, that gives us an ability to go very quickly when we get there using, for example, rapid prototyping or if it's far enough along, even just a rapid fielding pathway uh, if we need to. Great. Thank you all. I, I would like to, I think, wrap this up now. Uh, and I'd like to thank all our panel members for the, the great job they did today. I think we had a wonderful discussion you know, across the whole enterprise of acquisition logistics and technology. On behalf of General Brown and AUSA, you'll see there's a little a little uh, box uh, on your table. It's a little token of his appreciation, so please take that with you. And uh, Mr. Bush, if you have any final closing comments, I'll let you close. Uh, I don't. Uh, I just want to thank my panel members um, for everything, doing this with us today, and for all of you for uh, participating, and just very excited about where the Army is and where we're going. Great. Thank you very much, everyone.